Good morning, everybody. I heard from uh, a couple of women uh, that they had a great time yesterday at the uh, women's event. Thank you, Lynette, for uh, putting that on. And uh, so it was really good. Uh, Jay Rathman was hunting in the ba Tehima Wildlife Region by uh, Red, La Red Bluff, California. And he was hiking up a particularly steep place and uh, he looked over a ledge and he sensed movement by the right side of his face. A coiled rattler struck with lightning speed and it just missed his right ear. Got its fangs caught in his turtleneck sweater. And it struck with such the whole snake landed on his shoulder. Then it coiled around his neck. He reached with his left hand and grabbed it and squeezed and he could feel the warm venom going down his neck. At that point, he slipped and slid back down the hill, rocks and lava and dirt and his binoculars and his uh, uh, rifle bouncing along with him and he got stuck head down with his legs caught between two rocks. At that point, uh, the, rat, uh, the rattler, uh, uh, he, uh, he got free and he struck about eight times, just, uh, you know, just below his eye. And, uh, uh, and uh, so uh, Rathman uh, was able to uh, use his rifle, get a hold of his rifle to, to, to pry the, uh, the fangs loose. And uh, that's when the rattler uh, struck uh, some more times. Uh, he's, he, he was worried that he was going to pass out because he was downhill. And so he just decided he had to kill the snake and just strangled it to death. When he was done, he tried to shake the snake loose but his his hands were so tight on it he couldn't do it and he had to pry his fingers off he estimated that the uh, uh, the whole event he was face to face with the rattler and uh, he says rattlers don't blink and uh, he said it took about 20 minutes now, you and I may not be able to relate to a rattler striking multiple times, uh, but we all face tests that are like that, that just won't go away. To put it in another analogy, we all know what it means to face giants. Giants come in all different shapes and sizes. Let me name a few. A terminal illness, recurring sickness that leaves you exhausted, uh, the harassment of a lawsuit against you, unemployment, pornography you can't refuse, alcohol you can't resist, a broken romance, the end of a marriage that leaves you devastated, a death of a loved one that's brought on depression, panic attacks, a financial disaster. Such giants don't just evaporate into thin air. Even when we pray or we discover a verse. How many of you know the story of David killing Goliath? Raise your hand. All right, most of you. Um, turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel 17. If you want to use one of the Bibles we have, it's on page 284, about a third of the way into the Bible. As we turn to this a famous story, it's not Goliath of Gath I'm concerned with. My concern is the giant or giants that you're facing. For 40 days, Goliath came out twice every day, morning and night, to taunt the living God and the armies of Israel. He said, send someone out to fight me. Who among you will fight me? Your giants do the same. First thing in the morning, Last worry of the night, your giant dominates your life. The Philistines came out to do battle with the Israelites. They lined up on one side, the Israelites on the other, a plain in between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, Gath was one of five of the major Philistine cities. This is along the Mediterranean coast of, of current day Israel. 
He came out against the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. That's nine feet, nine inches tall. Now, if you're not a Christian, you might be thinking, this is one of the reasons I don't believe the Bible. It's filled with fables like this, since no human can be that tall. But nine feet is not unparalleled in history. Josephus mentions a Jew 10 feet tall. And Goliath cannot be taller than the uncle of Iran who walked into Berlin in 1857. There are many men in the world today that exceed eight feet tall, and the NBA could field many teams with players over seven feet. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. That would be 125 pounds. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. That's like 25 pounds. His shield bearer went ahead of him. He wears a size 20 collar. He has a 56 inch waist, biceps burst. Think of mine when you think of him. And his uh, thighs ripple with muscles. Goliath re issued a challenge for an Israelite to come out and fight him. All the Israelites cowered in fear. No one dared step into the ring with Goliath. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? He was the king of Israel. Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight. Why have so many men get killed? Why not settle the war with just two men? One for one army and one for the other. This is a pretty good plan. If you have a nine-foot giant on your team. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. The battle hadn't even begun, and they're dismayed. They're afraid. Four years had passed since David had been anointed the next king of Israel. Now he's 19 years old. His father sent him from tending the flocks to go out and bring food to his three older brothers who were in the army. When he came, he heard Goliath's challenge. Now, the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? After listening to this creep mock God, he asked, hey, why doesn't somebody here shut him up? And they look at him like, uh, he's huge. Amazing, isn't it? The same thing that caused many to cower in fear caused David to rise up to the challenge. What made the difference? The focus of their attention. The soldiers of the army focused on Goliath. David focused on God. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? He's belittling him. I know how conceited you are, how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Eliab attacks David's motives. David ignored it and stayed focused on God. Now what have I done, said David? Can I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. 
David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he's been a warrior from his youth. Saul questioned if David could succeed. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. He said, God will protect me just like he did before with the lion and the bear. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. It must have been a sight. David, a 36 regular, wearing Saul's uh, uh, armor, a 52 long. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Now, if you're not a Christian, again, you would say, now, this is crazy. A slingshot, that's how you're going to fight? But a sling was considered a recognized weapon of war. In Judges 20, verse 16, we're told that there were 700 chosen men from the tribe of Benjamin who were left-handed and could sling a stone and not miss. Think of a target. They could hit the center time and again. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. This is a joke. You're sending him out against me? He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Apparently, David had a staff, shepherd's staff, and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. He was a toothpick versus a tornado, a mini bike attacking an 18-wheeler. What odds do you give David in this contest? Better odds, perhaps, than you give yourself against your giant? Then David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands." David had a plan. He didn't want to get too close to Goliath. He knew that he could sling a stone further than Goliath could throw the spear. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. You might say that David knew how to get ahead of his giant. I worked on that pretty hard. God turned a smooth stone into a laser guided missile to strike the giant in the one place that was not protected by his helmet. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Seldom are our giants dispatched as quickly as David's. David would learn this was the one time God would help him win a battle on one day with one stone. 
Most of the problems he would face the rest of his life would drag on for years. David killed Goliath. How was he able to take down his giant? How are we able to take down the giants we face? Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, you need to know how to stare down your giants. I think the lesson we learn is that we have to focus on God. Parents, this is an important truth to teach your son or daughter. Studies show that teenagers are more stressed today than any time in the past. Uh, teenagers, to take down your giants, you have to focus on God instead of your giants. So how can we take down our giants by focusing on God? I find three things from David that will help you focus on God. One, focus on bringing glory to God. Why did David get in the ring with Goliath? Was it to make a name for himself? Was it to make life easier for him? No, he did it to bring glory to God. He wanted everyone to know that the God of Israel was the creator of the universe. He faced off against Goliath to show all the people that there is a God who rules the world. You know, we get worried about turning off people today by speaking about our faith in Jesus. But I think people get more turned off by how quiet we are about Christ and our faith. Tom Rainer in his book, The Unchurched Next Door, says from his surveys that people who don't believe in Jesus and don't go to church think it's strange that Christians never talk about their faith or their church they would be more impressed if we talked about our faith and showed some excitement about our church. You say, I would speak out more about Jesus if I thought one person could make a difference. Don't ever think that one person can't make a difference. Goliath thought he had scared off the army of Israel. But God only needed one person who was confident in him to take up the challenge willing to risk his life against Goliath. David knew that with God, he was more than a match for Goliath. Why in the world would David get in the ring with Goliath? It wasn't to show how athletic he was or how skilled he was. It wasn't to show him that he was ranked number one in slingshot in the Middle Eastern Premier League. It was so people would know how great God is. He tells us so that the whole world will come to know that there is a God in Israel. It was all about God's glory. We always have a better shot of taking down our giant when our motivation is to bring God glory. You say, Lord, help me live in obedience because if I don't, your name will be dragged through the mud. Lord, help me forge a strong marriage because if my marriage goes down the tube, people who know that I'm a Christian will say, see, Christ doesn't make any difference. Lord, help my kids make wise choices because people know I'm a Christian and if my kids go off the rail, your name will be ridiculed. Lord, help me lead this company wisely not just so we make profits and so my name is great, but for your honor. Lord, help me not succumb to depression so I can demonstrate your power. If your motivation in all that you do is to bring glory to Christ, you have a lot better shot at taking down your giants. It's not just about you bringing honor to you and your company, your family. It's about bringing honor to God. If you stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about bringing glory to God, that helps you focus on God and take down your giants. Two, remember former battles God helped you win. When Saul asked David how he could possibly win against Goliath, he told him about times when God had helped him kill a lion and a bear. Now, I've told you this uh, many times. 
I begin my day with God. I spend some time reading the Bible. I use our church journal. And then I pray through my day. And I think about each situation I know I'll face and I try to be very specific with God to help me through that. Then the next morning, I think through what happened the day before and I write down answers to prayer. Those answers that I've received have given me confidence for today because I remember what God has done in the past. At 7.52 a.m., May 20th, 1927, from Roosevelt Field in Long Island, a 25-year-old pilot named Charles Lindbergh fired up his single-engine, single-seat airplane, the Spirit of the St. Louis. Lindbergh ran out of runway before he ran out of, uh, you know, he, but there was no turning back. He had no brakes. And he took off. And he flew across the Atlantic. Uh, he couldn't have much weight, so he took practically nothing with him. He had um, not even a toothbrush. He took a quart of water and five ham and chicken sandwiches. And he only ate one of them. Um, he had less experience than other people. Six people before him have tried to, 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 to fly between Europe and the United States and they'd all failed, buried at sea. But what he lacked in experience, he more than made up for with determination and mental toughness. He had no radio. He had no fuel gauge. He got next to no sleep the night before. Through darkness and a moonless night, he flew. He flew as high as 10,000 feet and as low as 10 feet, fighting his way through fog over 1,000 miles. The next morning, he had the first inkling that he was getting close to Europe when he saw a fisherman. And so he cut the throttle and flew down, and he yelled out the cockpit, Where's Ireland? And the guy either didn't understand English or he was scared to death because he didn't answer. So he kept going. And at sunset that night, he could see the lights of Paris. And he flew around the Eiffel Tower and he aimed for an airfield that he thought was empty. He made it, but it wasn't empty. Thousands of people lined the runway yelling, Vive! He had conquered the first person to get across the Atlantic. He won a $25,000 award. And he won the hearts of millions of people around the world. 250,000 newspapers around the world wrote stories about him with 30, using 36 million words. He had so many fans, he got 3.5 million letters that Western Union had to put 38 staff on his mail. How did he do it? How did he fight through the fear and the fog and the fatigue? Here's my theory. During the darkest hours of the night, I think Charles was motivated by his grandfather, August Lindbergh. He immigrated from Sweden in 1859. He came and he worked in a, a sawmill in uh, Minnesota. Two years after he'd been here, he fell against a whirring saw and cut his arm and his torso. It was cut so deep that eyewitnesses says we could see his heart beating. They carried him home and he sat there for three days before a doctor came. When the doctor came, he amputated what was uh, left of his arm, and then he sewed up his torso. And here's the amazing thing. Lindbergh never so much as let out an ouch. No anesthetic. He just took the pain. With what his grandfather had gone through, 
Lindbergh flying across the Atlantic, that was like a piece of cake. Remembering what his grandfather had done gave him strength. Remember your lion and bear stories. They add muscle to your mind. Remembering former battles God has helped you win helps you focus on today and take down your giants. Three, this is the most important point. Think more, think about God more than your giants. When David showed up on the battle lines, he found all the soldiers thinking about Goliath. But David talked about God. Most saw only Goliath. David saw God. The soldiers mentioned nothing about God. The brothers never spoke of him. But David took one step onto the sage and talked about the living God. He saw the giant, mind you, but he saw God more. Luciana Morales was born in Sao Paulo, Brazil. He should have been a story of tragic abuse and abandonment. His mom and dad were both drug addicts. His mom was such an addict that she took drugs all through the pregnancy. Everybody thought the baby wouldn't make it. And if he, if he was, did make it, you know, he'd be greatly disabled. First two years of his life, his parents took care of him, if you could call it that. He was undernourished. There were some days he never was touched. Got no food. How he made it to his first birthday, I have no idea. His father abandoned him. His mom was assassinated when he was 12. His father's parents, seeing his plight and what he'd gone through, adopted him. At that point, he had a loving home. But when he was a teenager, he chose to leave home. And he married his high school uh, sweetheart when she was 19. I think he was 20. Erwin McManus met him, and he writes about this story in his book, uh, The Last Arrow. And he was doing a deal in 2014 to bring uh, uh, the World Cup to Rio de Janeiro. Huge deal, all these parties involved. And McManus says he has a hard time describing what Morales does, but it's like he's a serial entrepreneur. He works with the highest tier of leadership around the world. He flies to Geneva and uh, Johannesburg and Chicago and Sao Paulo doing these deeds. So McManus asked him, he said, how many people do you think you've employed over the years? He thought about it for a moment and he kind of rounded it off. He said, 30,000. Who would think that a boy who had gone through the abuse and abandonment he did would provide jobs for 30,000 people. Luciana could have brooded over his troubled past, but instead he focused on the grace God had shown him. If you've never given your life to Christ, you could give your life to him today and he could help you take down your giants. Look through 1 Samuel 17 if you have your Bible open. Note the observation David makes regarding Goliath. I find only two. One statement uh, to Saul about Goliath and the other to Goliath's face. That's it. Now notice how many times he talks about God. Verse 26, the armies of the living God. Verse 36, the armies of the living God. Verse 45, the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. Verse 46, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. Verse 47, the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. He will give you 
into my hands. I count nine references to God. God thoughts outnumber Goliath thoughts nine to two. How does that compare with your ratio? Do you ponder God's grace four times as much as you think about your guilt? Is your list of blessings four times longer than your list of complaints? Is your file of hope four times as thick as your mental file of dread? Are you four times as likely to talk about the strength of God as you are the demands on your day? No? Then David is your man. God called David a man after my own heart. He said that of no one else, not of Abraham, not of Moses, not of Peter, not of John. One might read the story of David and think, how can he be a man after God's own heart? The fellow fell as often as he stood. He stumbled as often as he conquered. He took down Goliath, but he ogled at Bathsheba. He rushed Goliath, but he murdered Uriah. He could lead the armies of Israel, but he couldn't manage his family. A man after God's own heart? That God saw him as such gives hope to every one of us here. We ride the same roller coaster. We alternate between swan dives and belly flops, souffles and burnt toast. In David's good moments, no one was better. In his bad moments, could anybody be worse? We need David's story. Giants lurk in our neighborhoods we must face them, but we don't have to face them alone. Focus on God first and most. The times David did, giants fell. The days he didn't, David did. How do you become a person after God's own heart? You focus on God. Read this with me. Focus on giants, you stumble. Focus on God, your giants tumble. Let's read that again, make sure we've got it. Focus on giants, you stumble. Focus on God, your giants tumble. Lift your eyes. The God who made a miracle out of David stands ready to make one out of you. Thank you, God, for this story. We all have giants that have us afraid, discouraged, worried. We don't know how we're going to take them on. Help us to do like David did. Notice the giant, of course, but keep our focus on you. You want to tell God that today? Why don't, why don't you pray right now? I'll give you a little time. If you've never given your life to Christ, you can say, Christ, I want you in my life. I want your power in me, and I want to keep my focus on you. Thank you for dying for my sins. Come into my life. Think about your giants right now. Tell God about them. He already knows, but it's good for you to verbalize them. And say, God, in face of those, I'm choosing to focus more on you than them. You pray silently. Lord God, thank you for things you tell us in the Bible that give us courage to face our day. And so we go into this week with new courage. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.